Paul, Executive Director of Clean Start, and you're watching the Clean Tech Meetup on Energy Storage. This meetup features Mark Rose, Director of Marketing and International Development at Sustainable Energy Inc., Michael Gravely, Team Lead and Senior Electrical Engineer for the Energy Systems Research Office at the California Energy Commission, and Garrett Woodruff, General Manager at Villar Energy Systems. And first up, we're going to have Mark Rose, Director of Marketing and International Development at Sustainable Energy, um, take us through his presentation. Mark has been a, a regular attendee at these meetups and has always pushed the battery discussion, talking about new chemistries and new possibilities in it. So I would like to welcome Mark Rose. I'm going to get his slides up in just a second. And actually, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through the slides about halfway through. So hello. Uh, Sustainable Energy Inc. develops and will manufacture Ron, ceramic. Let me go. Let me get your slides up so everyone can see them. All right, everyone, see the slides. All right, we're good. All right, go ahead. Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. We can okay. Play. All right. So, Sustainable Energy Inc. develops and will manufacture ceramic semiconductor material science applications, including batteries, solar thin film, and substitutes for rare earth materials. We're developing a saline-based ceramic battery that we model reaching more than 2,300 watt hours per kilogram capacity with fast charging capability, low cost, and high safety. For comparison, today's best batteries are around 350 watt hours per kilogram, just one sixth as much. We expect to reach 5,000 charging cycles in early volume production and pass 10,000 cycles as we move up the learning curve. We are close to a testable prototype of the battery after making 14,000 electrodes over nine years of development effort. We plan to fabricate the batteries in a ceramic floor tile factory, a mature high volume technology. Our CTO and founder, William Todorov, won the patent for the first multi-junction thin film solar PV designed for volume production in 1983. It was rated 22.5% efficient when the rest of the world was at Five to seven percent. After heavily modifying both the original silicon alloy fast semiconductor thin film design and a design for copper indium gallium selenide PV licensed from Enrel in 1993, he stacked them for modeled 48 percent total efficiency. That is twice the best. That is twice the best solar panel efficiency that is commercially produced today. So it only takes half as much space to meet the same demand, which is important for trucks. Imagine converting most of the existing vehicle fleet to full battery electric power with manufactured conversion kits with thousands of cooperatives and traditional mechanics installing the kits all over the world. Now imagine putting up enough rooftop and canopy solar PV to power both buildings and all the vehicles associated with them, feeding batteries that provides load shifting from day to night and support local smart microgrids as well as main grids. This can become the way most people get and use electricity at home or work and on the road. Wind energy can make up the difference when solar PV and battery storage fall short in electricity deliveries. Wind turbines can also use on-site battery storage to smooth delivery through the transmission lines. Our CTO developed and patented a gearless wind turbine energy conversion generator, which would cost less than geared generators. It would be several times more reliable so it would last far longer, saving the cost of multiple replacements. A 12 megawatt gearless wind turbine generator was modeled by Enril and would be manufactured by a European turbine manufacturer or is already. It is a slight evolution of our design, which William had previously shown to Enril. Neodymium iron boron magnets make up a significant part of the cost of a large high performance generator or motor. Several years ago, William was asked to design a substitute for the rare earth neodymium for a ceramics glaze that needed the special pink cast that it produces because it was out of stock at Alfred University, William's alma mater and the world's top ceramics school. He thought about it that evening and the next afternoon he whipped one up and it worked in the glaze. So a year ago, he pulled out his notes and revised the formula for the neodymium substitute making it part of a new formula to take the place of neodymium iron boron magnets. This formula may produce magnets with 15% greater pull force than the original neodymium magnets at a third the cost. William also designed a production process using the same ceramic floor tile fabrication technology we will use for the battery. We plan to use the substitute magnets in variations of the wind turbine de generator design 
for everything from wheel motors for trucks and buses to ducted fans and turbo fans for aircraft to power for ship propellers. All of them will use our batteries. Many of them will also convert sunlight to electricity with our solar thin filaments stored in the batteries. Now I'm gonna show some slides that focus on the batteries and our first market, which is truck, trucks that work in ports and rail hubs. So I am the Director of Marketing and International Development at Sustainable Energy Inc. And I work with a team that includes Cyber Switching, Grain Fleets Group and the Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition. Next slide, please. Sustainable Energy Inc. is developing a family of advanced and disruptive fired multicrystalline ceramic semiconductor technologies, battery and solar PV for distributed energy, support the solar fueling concept, extremely compact and deployable, a highly disruptive performance to cost ratios. Next slide, please. A safe SCI ceramic battery will have three to seven times the range per kilo of lithium batteries that means heavy trucks may go 750 miles on one charge with a full payload while observing the gross vehicle weight rating limit. Twice commercial solar PV efficiency, half the area to provide the energy they need. Next slide, please. The founder, CTO and board chair is William Todorov who set the stage for solar PV in 1983 with his multi-junction thin film patent. Now he's redesigned it and he's building a fired ceramic battery to solve range, safety, and cost issues. And um, I'm building the business as a whole systems thinker with 45 years multidisciplinary experience. Next slide, please. So from research to, produ to production, we start with handmade R&D and that will scale to a 50 million square foot per year ceramic mini tile factory repurposed to make our mini tiles. Next slide, please. We'll sell to OEMs, but the focus is battery electric vehicle conversions. We have a customer number one who wants to convert six trucks and provide parking and solar charging for 300 trucks at a planned trucking services center and 300 more in another area in a port, in the Port of Oakland. A diesel to BEV conversion kit maker will buy from us when we launch. He tests batteries on his NASA grade test system that he made himself. We plan to convert 8,000 class eight trucks to BEV for the California Air Resources ban on diesels with engine model year 2009 and earlier in ports and rail hubs during 2022. The ban starts January 1st of 23. Then scale with both trucks and buses. Next slide, please. So, we're going to swap SEI batteries and Ed Monfort's motors in and diesel engines out for long range and full payloads. The, uh, Bob, oh, I can't deal with, okay. Utilities are aiming to make I5, I5 a West Coast electric highway for commercial trucks. Next, and we have a, a person in our network who has sites all, all up along I5. Now this map shows you the percent of resident, residential customers with solar storage cheaper than the utility retail rate. And that would likely also apply to where the best sites are for truck uh, purchases of solar energy instead of from the grid. So California is 90%, uh, New Arizona 85, New Mexico 84, Texas 60. And, the Appalachians and the Northwest are not good places for, for it, um, but you can see the most of the rest of the country is pretty good. Next slide, please. I don't understand the economics. The cost of batteries and solar PV is a drop in the bucket compared to global GDP and to climate chaos costs. Cost is saved during financing for no net negative cash flow and I just lost my slide, Michael, okay. And paid off in two to six years, depending on an application. If customers own a battery electric vehicle, photovoltaics and storage and management and can realize their full value, they can increase disposable income by 25 to 30% after paying off the financing and achieve prosperity. The reason is that throughout most economic classes, uh, people spend 15% of their income on transportation and 10% for electricity in the United States. 
and outside the United States, it's 15% for electricity. That's where the 25 to 30% comes from. Next slide, please. Onward, converting and charging trucks, buses, and aircraft. That's where we're headed. And we have done a bunch of designs of aircraft. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for that presentation there. And so we're going to do a couple quick swaps here. So I'm getting ready for I'm getting ready for things. So next, I would like to like welcome Michael Gravely. Um, to, to present. He is the team lead and senior electrical engineer for the Energy Systems and Research Office at the California Energy Commission. His team is managing over 300 million in microgrid energy storage and related energy research and demonstration projects. In this role, he oversees the full spectrum of research activities to improve the California electrical grid, including assessing future energy storage needs in California and addressing the grid related issues associated with integrating higher concentrations of renewables. In 2020, the Energy Commission awarded over 100 million in state funds, a vendor cost share investment to over 25 new grants to complete research and demonstration projects with new and emerging energy storage techniques. One key area of this research is focused on, on understanding the capability and value of long duration energy storage solutions. That's from 10 to 100 plus hours in time. Uh, to assist California in this transition to reach the goal of 100% zero carbon resources by December 31st, 2045. Um, that was the goal of, of that investment. Um, Gravelli has a BSE from Virginia Military Institute, as well as an MSE from California State University, Sacramento. Great to have you back. I'm assuming that was at the <laughs> College of Engineering Computer Science, um, where I'm going to assume you went there with... Um, Paul Lau um, of SMUD. <laughs> um, prior to the Energy Commission, Mike served as an, in executive positions in the federal government and private industry, including addressing the business challenges of a startup energy storage company. Mike also advises the, serves as a military advisor to the chair of the California Energy Commission. As military advisor, he leverages his over 22 years of military service to coordinate um, energy uh, to coordinate energy commission activities with the Department of Defense bases in California. So with that wealth of experience, I would like to welcome um, Mike Graverly. I'm going to spotlight you and you'll see your slides come up. And when you do that, you can go ahead and um, okay. start. I think you can hear me okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, for, for this one, I want to talk a little bit about the Energy Commission role in the advancement of energy storage. The Energy Commission is the lead agency in the state uh, for the implementation of SB 100, which is our legislation requirement to have all clean energy by 2045. Next chart. So when you do this, and I'll talk about other states, it's very important to understand as you get higher and higher concentrations of renewables, energy storage becomes more and more important. And actually the higher the percentage of renewables, longer duration energy storage, according to the models becomes even more important than, than uh, short duration storage. Uh, next chart. So last year or this year, the key agencies within the state, the Energy Commission, the Public Utilities Commission, the Air Resources Board and the and Independent System Operator got together and produced an, a, uh, integrated a joint report uh, on how do we get to our goals of 2045. Two key elements that are defined in that report is there's a need to triple the growth of renewables uh, to meet that uh, and the build out to meet that requirement and at eight times uh, the requirement to an uh, energy storage. So California is going to be the energy storage market probably in the world for the next five to 10 years. And you'll see more as I go forward. Next chart. So California, I, I was actually selected 20 years ago when I entered the commission for my energy storage background. And over the last decade, 
we have done a wealth of projects, everything from residential to customer side to grid scale and, and uh, the full spectrum of technologies from large scale like uh, compressed air and pumped hydro to utility scale, flow batteries, flywheels, advanced batteries, zinc batteries. Uh, and we have uh, quite a few projects that are using lead acid battery, I mean, uh, lithium ion batteries. Next chart. Well, this just shows you the technologies we're investing in now. We probably have uh, 15 to 20 different technologies right now, depending on whether you're talking uh, in, the, in the small grant area. So we actually award grants in three areas. One is applied research, uh, one is demonstration, and one is in market facilitation. So for applied research is basically when you're building your first prototype and uh, technology demonstration is you have an operating system and you want to grow it or you're grow closer to commercialization and then technology demonstration, we focus on barriers and permitting and things to make systems work better. For example, we're funding a energy storage guidebook to help uh, California cities uh, site uh, up to a one megawatt size storage in their facility and help them with the permitting process. So the technologies we talk about are obviously advanced batteries. Uh, for example, we have six different companies that are using zinc-based batteries right now. Uh, we have about four companies on flow batteries, uh, two for flywheels, uh, thermal storage, a couple of advanced pumped hydro. We have one primary project right now. We don't do much when it comes to just pure pumped hydro because that's pretty much a commercial project and uh, we have done work in the past on compressed air. Uh, we are doing a lot of work on green hydrogen and I'll talk later, we're expecting to get a bunch more money to address green hydrogen. And obviously one of the goals of green hydrogen is seasonal storage in the future. Next chart. So it, as I mentioned before, in 2020, there was a big bill. We $100 million uh, in one year was a big investment for us for energy storage. That includes about 65 million state funds and about 45 million in uh, contractor match funds or grantee match funds. Uh, we, we did some lithium ion batteries where we looked at battery second use, but the majority of the funding uh, was for non-lithium ion. Uh, we awarded a full spectrum. So we awarded eight grants to do 10 hours of storage, and we did another five grant, three grants to do 100 hours of storage. Uh, and the uh, three grants, uh, the, the 100 hour storage systems are in the early development phase. So they will be building their first prototype in California, uh, probably in about 18 months, still should be through building those. And then uh, we also awarded two $1.5 million grants, one to the university and one to, just a second, my. Uh, light goes off in this office here. Have to just sit still too long. So um, to look at one to university and one to industry, E3 and University of California Merced are the two grantees and looking at long duration storage and as California goes to the future, how, uh, how should we um, mix up that? Right now the current model shows 90% of the storage should be short duration, which is four hours or less and 10% it should be long duration. I expect that number to grow as we get down the rain and learn, and learn more about it. Next chart. So this is a big area for us. So I didn't show the chart here, but the, the Public Utilities Commission has what they call the integrated resource plan. And they show that we need uh, 10,000 megawatts of storage of which 2,500 has been funded so far of which only 1500 has been actually installed and operating. So if you look at the next six to seven years, we'll be, we'll be basically buying another 7,500 megawatts of storage. And that plan I talked about that we did with the multi-agency says we need another 20 to 30,000 megawatts of storage after 2030 to reach our goal by 2045. So you're talking about a, a huge change and uh, I mean, huge opportunity for energy storage. One of the big questions for us is the different durations and even defining what is long duration. For California, we're defining long duration as starting at eight to 10 hours, uh, as I mentioned, the grants that we do. And then seasonal is typically um, a week or more, but we're starting to look at those. One of the things I'm trying to figure out is what is the duty cycle? So I mentioned we have four different grants that are doing 100 hours of storage 
And so the question is, if you have 100 hours of storage, how do you use it? And then when it comes to seasonal, there was a legislative workshop recently on seasonal storage that is looking at that. And so one of those questions becomes, you know, if we're going to have kind of an energy uh, reserve like we do with the, a, a national fuel reserve, a state energy reserve in the future. But, you know, we're just we're trying to struggle. If you've got a technology that you're going to use once every two or three years and it costs you $50, 000, $50 million, how do you how do you finance that and how do you maintain that? Next chart. So the last thing I want to mention is that this is a very exciting time. Uh, last year, the governor signed a budget of which it included uh, in the budget $735 million that would come to our division to do four things. One of those was long duration storage, $340 million to do long duration storage demonstrations, $100 million to work on green uh, hydrogen, and then another 210 for industrial decarb and food processing. So the 340 million, uh, and what happened was originally the legislature was, the money is in the bank. The legislature is supposed to, re, uh, to release it. They were gonna do that by October, but they decided to defer that decision till January. Uh, all indications are eventually they will approve this and we will get the money to do that. And, and in this one, we'll be looking at projects that are in the range of, initially one to five megawatts for 10 hour, eight to 10 hours, and then later five to 10 megawatts. One of the big challenges in these projects is to get financing. When you look at all the projects we have in California, most of them are power purchase agreements. If you have lithium ion, uh, there's no problem getting a banker to finance you. If you have a new battery, if you have a flywheel, if you have a flow battery, it's almost impossible to get a bank to finance you for 20 years. So we're working a lot in trying to do that. And this money will help us a lot in advancing companies to do that. Next chart. And so I'll be happy to answer questions later uh, about anything and all the technologies we're working. So I have been uh, to do that. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have an open discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Michael. Next, I would like to welcome Garrett Woodruff, General Manager of Valara Energy Systems. You might recognize Valara from some of the other companies that are kind of under their umbrella, which includes HVAC and other energy efficiency programs. Um, they've actually done quite a bit of actually growth in this area and it's been exciting to watch. So I'm really interested to hear what Garrett's gonna be sharing today. So I'm gonna spotlight you Garrett and go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Wonderful, thank you, sir. Uh, let's see here. My screen sharing option seems to have moved. Oh, there it is, share. So we'll stop somebody else's screen sharing, yes. Wonderful. Okay, is that working okay? Good to me. Wonderful, okay, I'm gonna stop my video for bandwidth reasons. Okay, um, first off, I do want to thank um, all of you for tuning in. Uh, also, many thanks to Clean Start for putting this together, and for inviting me to speak on this exciting topic. Today, we're gonna to talk about home batteries and battery chemistries. So why should we care about home batteries? Why do homeowners, why are they even interested in purchasing a home battery? Two pretty compelling reasons. One that's you're probably no stranger to is peak shaving. So most utilities, uh, at least in California, especially in California are moving their consumers to time of use plans where they pay more for energy during peak hours and less for energy during the off peak hours. Sometimes that difference is maybe only 10%, sometimes 17%, sometimes 18 cents um, more per kilowatt hour. Um, and so when you can uh, install a home battery, then you can charge that battery while the energy is inexpensive to purchase and then just rely on the energy in your battery and avoid those peak rates. So that peak shaving is compelling. Probably even more compelling is the backup application and value. Um, so I know I live in an area where we had some extended blackouts a couple of years ago. Uh, the expectation for all, most of the customers that had solar arrays on their roof was that the solar would power their home during the day while the sun was shining. Um, and then of course the reality was that most solar systems don't work if the uh, if the grid is down, and so there we're not generating electricity, 
and they were unable to power the home. So the reality, they were, they were just as powerless as uh, the others, but probably quite a bit more frustrated. Many of those have since installed batteries, a small battery, and for the axes here, you can see different months of the year and then different times of the day. So a small battery can not only allow your solar array to produce during the day, but it can also give you energy even into the evening hours. A larger battery can do that and oftentimes give you energy all the way through the following morning until your solar system is able to start producing again. So pretty compelling case for backup for even just a small battery, let alone a large battery. So people are interested. So that's those are home batteries. I want to talk to you a little bit about lithium ion batteries because not all uh, lithium ion batteries are created equally. So um, real quick, a lithium ion battery is simply called a lithium ion battery because they use lithium ions uh, and they move those between an anode and a cathode to induce electrons to go between the anode and the cathode. But there are many different options for materials for the anode and the cathode. So here are four different flavors of lithium ion batteries. An older one that you don't typically see in home batteries anymore is the nickel cobalt aluminum oxide battery. Um, a newer one um, is a nickel manganese cobalt uh, battery. Uh, an even newer one that's becoming more and more popular is a lithium iron phosphate um, lithium ion battery. Notice that each of these batteries uses graphite in the anode. They are only differentiated in the cathode. So um, Velar Energy Systems and I am most excited right now about lithium titanate batteries. The lithium titanate batteries and battery chemistry uses a fundamentally elementally different anode material. Uh, and that gives a few different advantages. So the first is power. Lithium titanate can release and receive more ions, more electrons faster. So that means you can charge and discharge the battery faster. Most batteries can't charge very quickly or else they're prone to wear out or even overheat. The second reason uh, we like lithium titanate is safety. Graphite is flammable. It's essentially pure carbon. Um, and it is a two out of four on the NFPA flammability scale. And uh, contrast that with lithium titanate, which is non-flammable and a zero out of four. Third reason is useful life. Lithium titanate just lasts longer. It doesn't grow dendrites and wear out as quickly as a graphite anode does. Uh, another reason is that lithium titanate is more tolerant of extreme temperatures. So uh, a lot of batteries will claim that they're operating through, a, let's, let's say lithium ion batteries, will claim operating temperatures of down to negative four degrees Fahrenheit and up to around 122 degrees Fahrenheit. A uh, dirty little secret of the battery industry is that most of the NMC and LFP batteries cannot actually receive a charge um, below roughly freezing temperatures um, unless they employ an uh, active heating element like an electric blanket for your battery, preheat it, preheat it so that it can charge it up. Um, the reason for that is that graphite, when it gets below freezing, you run the risk of lithium plating if you try to charge the battery. So many of them won't charge below roughly freezing temperatures, but can still discharge down to about negative four degrees Fahrenheit. Contrast that with lithium titanate, which can go all the way down to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way up to 131. Okay, how'd that picture get in there? All right, so now we've talked about home batteries, we've talked about lithium ion batteries. So let's put those together and talk about the value of home batteries. And one of the things that Velar Energy doing is really trying to educate the market and to think about home batteries differently. So uh, another dirty little secret of home batteries is usable energy. So when a home battery is installed, the installer will set a lower limit and an upper limit on the state of charge. Essentially batteries wear out too quickly if you let the battery state of charge get too low or too high. So LFP batteries, for example, uh, typically installed with a lower limit of about 15% and an upper limit of 85 to 95 uh, to 90%. But 15% to 90% means that only 75% of the battery is actually usable on a daily basis. 
Contrast that with an LTL battery, which you can take all the way down to about 4% and all the way up to about 99%. So a whole lot more usable energy on a daily basis. So more usable energy, 20 years instead of 10. And by the way, you can even get multiple cycles per day. This all kind of comes together to mean that an LTO battery can deliver two to four times the lifetime energy. Think of lifetime energy like the total miles you've put on your car, like the odometer. Um, I think lifetime energy is a very important and overlooked metric when it comes to valuing batteries. So when you are comparing home batteries, I really uh, want, to, it, want you to consider these two value metrics. Most of the market right now thinks in terms of one-time use. How big, what is the battery capacity and how much does it cost? I think that a, a better way to think of the value of batteries is to think about lifetime energy per cost. Um, and of course, with lithium titanate, lithium titanate typically costs more, uh, but you, get, you can get so much more lifetime energy um, that the lifetime energy per cost metric is pretty good. Um, and with the additional power of lithium titanate, you get also a pretty good value in terms of power per dollar. So um, that is everything for my presentation. I'm looking forward to the discussion here coming up in a bit. All right, well, round of applause for all three of our presenters because those are really excellent presentations. Oh, you're here, Gary. I didn't even notice see you come in. Oh, you're on your phone? Oh, I'm on the phone. All right, well, I'm gonna quickly switch over and we can start the... So now we're on to the presentation per portion. So I'm gonna welcome back Mark Rose, Mike Graber, and Garrett Woodruff. Uh, and um, I'm gonna let Gary go ahead and start it. I'm gonna spotlight the four of you. And... All right. Take it away. All right, well, just following on uh, with you, Garrett, um, interesting uh, that you chose the lithium titanate batteries. In terms of suppliers of the LTO batteries, for a number of years, the, the only serious vendor was Toshiba, but I don't know what's happened in the last few years. Are there now multiple vendors for the LTO battery? I, th I think Toshiba is still the best source um, and, and by the way, Toshiba is exactly where we source our lithium titanate battery cells. All right. Um, and I mean, the way they construct those, you could either try maximum power or maximum energy out of them. So I don't know where you've uh, come up on configuration, but uh, there was a lot of flexibility in what Toshiba was offering. Is that what you found too? Yeah, they they have kind of two different lines. Uh, one of one where they're really optimizing for power, as as you alluded to, and one where they're optimizing for energy. Um, mm -hmm. However, the the battery line where they're optimizing for energy, um, with the you know combination of battery cells and series and parallel that we're using, uh, gives you all of the that energy, but also a whole lot more power compared to everything else. Right. So, that um, that ended up being the most compelling combination for us. So say that again, the, the one that you took was the, the power option or did you do a mix of batteries in your system? Um, the, so we're using the more ener energy oriented okay, the, uh, Toshiba yeah, yeah. batteries, mm -hmm. okay. but um, we're, in spite of the fact that we're using those, we're delivering about twice as much power as most of the other batteries on the market. Yes, yes. So, I mean, looking ahead, Garrett, um, and you've got GM sort of made its bet on a series of, of batteries. Ford and uh, BMW, I think, have, have made a bet on another kind of battery. Tesla's made its bet with QuantumScape. Uh, those are all batteries that are probably more oriented towards um, power. Um, and of course, in electric vehicles. But uh, you seem to have a pretty good understanding of the landscape of, of batteries. Do you see the the energy storage capacity of batteries going up dramatically in in the next few years, or um, are we we at some kind of of peak in in volumetric energy density? 
Well, for, um, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the electric vehicles uh, along the way there, because a lot of the ways that we think about batteries uh, really come from the electric vehicle market where people are appropriately and hyper-focused on uh, things like energy density, uh, you know, like per mass, um, because for an electric vehicle, it weighs twice as much, that matters a whole lot, right. um, versus you know, and, and even volumetrically, it, that matters, that makes a pretty big difference. Um, people have quite a bit more room in their garage than they do in their trunk. Um, and, uh, and if you're mounting something on a wall, I, I kind of don't care if it, if it weighs 250 pounds or, or 400 pounds, as long as it stays out of the way and, and doesn't fall off. <laughs> well, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, it doesn't fall on your head when you're walking out in the garage. How about pricing wise? Uh, can you tell us anything about where you are like relative to uh, Tesla Powerwall? Yeah, so um, let's see. The, so our, our battery you might, might've seen along the way is called the Villagrid battery. So the, um, we have a, a multiple sizes of batteries. So of course the price depends on the size and, and things like that. What people are really gonna care about is the, the all-in cost of the project because you're gonna care about the inverter um, you're going to care about uh, transfer switches and cabling and, and everything else uh, with, with, um, in terms of that. The Villagrid battery and a system with the Villagrid battery at its core is going to cost more than most of the other alternatives. Um, but in exchange for that, you get a battery that lasts 20 years instead of 10. Um, so you got double the useful life and, and roughly double the power. Um, and I don't know how to measure fire safety, but better, better safety, in my opinion. So when you talk about putting a system into a home, are you talking about 10 kilowatt hours capacity, 15 kilowatt hour capacity? What, what, what's your thought in terms of where you see the sweet spot? Yeah, so um, we have two primary sizes. One is 5.75 kilowatt hours. The other is 11.5 kilowatt hours. Um, how long those are gonna last? You know, the answer to all those kinds of questions is always it depends on the home and the time of the year and you know your particular usage and the day and even your mood. Um, but we picked those sizes because for a lot of homes, um, we think that 5.75 kilowatt hours will probably get them roughly through peak hours. So if they're focused on peak shaving, the, um, then you know we have a smaller battery that can serve that need pretty well for a lot of folks. Um, and 11.5 kilowatt hours for uh, a somewhat efficient home um, can actually get them all the way through the night um, if, uh, you know, if they're careful about their consumption um, and if they're in, uh, you know, if there's an extended power outage. So um, those are, that's the reason for those two sizes is, you know, hopefully a four or five hour um, peak rate period um, and then getting somebody through the night so that their solar is producing the next day. All right. Well, that, that's very interesting. Um, I, do you have any intelligence built into the, the battery system, like a communication capability with the utility to use it as a dispatchable resource, uh, ultimately part of the, the microgrid type systems? Yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't want to cover too much of the product because I didn't want it to be, I want to be more technology focused, not, not too, you know, salesy on this, but um Yes, there is monitoring available, um, you know, California Rule 21 compliant, CEC approved, um, 1741 SA. Um, so it's even this, even the systems that are already installed, um, I believe could be configured to become a distributed resource for a, a forward thinking utility. All right, well, sounds like you've got uh, a lot of opportunities there that, uh in the way that you're gonna develop that battery system and, and where it might evolve into the future. So let me turn back to, to Mark, um, different set of questions. Um, give me a sense, Mark, I, I mean, very good presentation there, but where are you on manufacturing capacity now? We, we saw the thing on, on trying to do the investment in a uh, manufacturing facility uh, on your slides. Um, are you manufacturing any substantial quantities of those now? I couldn't, I heard the metric on several thousand something was being produced, but in terms of full batteries, um, can you give us an idea where you are on that? Yeah, we have 
we've been operating in a garage like Hewlett and Packard and uh, for the last six years or so in the Valley of Death doing batteries by hand and firing them in a ceramic kiln that's got about a cubic foot of space inside it and no instrumentation uh, other than cones. So we are not in production yet. We are working on our testable prototype. And once we get that done, so we've been we've been going, you know, it's said that batteries are harder than solar, and um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> if you're trying to make an end run around the entire industry instead of incrementally improve what's already being done, it is a long, hard road. Uh, but we think we're near the end of that road. And um, so we're figuring that if we can get to a point where we can order a factory by March, April, or May, and then there's a good shot at having one installed and commissioned in September. And that would give us October, November, and December to handle the long haul trucks and bus the trucks in the ports and rail hubs of California which currently have 2009 and earlier engine model year diesels, which are all gonna be banned as of January 1st, 2023. So we're figuring, we're partnering with the, uh, the conversion kit person I talked about. He's in production, he's going into production and is going to get a factory um, for his conversion kits. And he'll be using the lithium batteries that he's chosen at first and then but for for the first for like for three quarters of the trucks that are I think three quarters of the trucks that are affected by that ban um, can be can do can work with lithium batteries without having a, a range problem. For those that do have a range problem because the weight of the batteries and the gross vehicle weight rating issue, those batteries we would come in and provide him the batteries for those. So he's our first customer. And the guy in the port that I mentioned is our first specific end use customer. So where are you in terms, I mean, very good that you've got the interest of the end use customers. Where are you in interest from any ceramic manufacturers uh, in we terms went, of helping we, out to make we, this? We, we expect to, well, so William Todorov was a consultant to the ceramics industry. He got his master's degree in ceramic manufacturing fabrication and has been doing this for 60 years. So um, he is going to buy a factory and run it. And once it's perfected, that'll be a pilot plant. 20 to 30 million kilowatt hours per year is what we consider a pilot plant. And he would run that um, and then hopefully by 2023, we would have 150 million kilowatt hour per year, full size uh, test you know, manufacturing plant. And those are ceramic floor tile factories with an assembly plant talk, tacked on at the end. And so let's see your question. I'm sorry. Well, I, missed... well, it, it, I mean, making a, a... A ceramic for a battery is more complicated than making a floor tile and so in terms of expertise and and experience just wondering yeah, he, yeah. With, so william with, has with, that with, yeah with, william with, is the master of that okay and so he he is the man he's the one who was brought into uh ceramic tile factories to solve problems that the families that owned them couldn't do, couldn't solve <laughs> well so we already have that but what i'm so what i'm saying is that we will Okay, I forgot what I forgot that I was trying to remember was that after we are in production and making factories, we will be able to convert existing ceramic factories at probably 100 million kilowatt hours per year rather than 150. Uh, so we do have a plan for being able to convert existing factories and there's thousands of them around the world now. Um, so what you're going to need a certain amount of money, and I don't know whether you mentioned it in order to get these factories going. But what's the raise to get the kind of factory for the for the pilot fabrication that you're talking about? That was 100 to 300 million dollars. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, so we figured we'll start with a laboratory. In the laboratory, we'll be doing some small stuff to prove that it works in different application areas, and if it works as spectacularly as we expect 
then we expect that the money will be forthcoming. All right. Well, I mean, it turns out you're in a good time because VC money uh, is going for uh, bargain prices right now. Um, and so you're potentially riding the crest of a very useful wave. Yeah. Now, uh, the other thing is about that funding is that the pilot plant could fund a full production plant in a year uh -huh. of full operation. And a full production plant could fund more than one full production plant per year of operation. So we have the potential for exponential growth without with internal funding. It's just the start, it's the launch, the catalyst that needs to go. But what that's going to do for the investment and return on investment is pretty spectacular. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a very creative and, and interesting idea. Now, let me take advantage of all the expertise that you have in this area, because uh, Mike Gravely has been focusing, as we ask him to, on the long duration storage, which is, I guess, different than what you're talking about for trucks and different what Garrett was talking about for the home. But in terms of your technology, would you foresee an application where you could meet the kind of metrics that, uh, that Mike was talking about for long duration storage? Or is there enough energy density? Absolutely, to... both directly, because our actual cost, we expect our cost to go down below $20 a kilowatt hour in terms of the marginal cost of goods sold within a few years. And we also plan to build these factories as I was, the geometric progression leads to the ability to stop fossil fuels by 2030 and keep going, keep manufacturing batteries for the resilience needs for emergency use and for um, direct air capture of, to, to complement the uh, massive amount of, of natural capture of carbon that we need to do. Uh, we can do I figure we might do 50% of the amount of batteries extra uh, just to do air capture. And all of that would be available for resilience whenever it comes up. So all of that would be doubling as long-term storage. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but be, if I can get down to $20 a kilowatt hour and I've got a lifetime of 10,000 hours, um, you know, the long duration storage is there, especially if, if I'm making extra batteries because I've, because I've, I've basically used up the direct addressable market and now I'm ready to keep on, but I've still got those factories that want to keep producing a bit. I do plan to shut down some of the factories, but not until we've got all the batteries out there that we really need and then keep some of them open for replacements. So volumetrically, uh, just as the size of what you're talking about there, I mean, it's, it, you said you saved weight. Um, you do have a higher energy density. I would expect then that um compared on the stationary side to a lot of what's being done with lithium-ion batteries now for the equivalent performance your facility would be much smaller is that correct it would be smaller and i'm guess we well if we're if we're at the one or two kilowatt hours per kilogram we're probably also at one or two kilowatt hours per liter mm -hmm. and so that's sort of close I don't know, you know, we'll find out how exactly close it is when we know exactly what what actually works in the battery. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very exciting prospect. There was a question I saw that came up on the application for the marine market. And I don't know whether that was for ships coming into port or or, or something else. Okay. But well, that would start with, you know, we would start with shoreside power, but I'm actually talking about um, about powering the ship. Now, in 1975, I designed a mast and spars for a Dyna ship, sailing cargo ship, which would be uh, a 120, 180 foot tall mast, 185 foot mast with 90 foot spars. And it came out at 15,000 pounds instead of 200,000 pounds because I made a fundamental design decision. The idea there was that you have sails and when there's enough wind to push the ship to the hull speed, you engage the propeller as a generator and you store that electricity in batteries. And I didn't even know I was going to have batteries back then, but, and I actually, I didn't know back then about the, uh, about the whole idea 
uh, uh, but this the you know the, the the technology exists and will be furthered for doing that and we also can use the gen the wind turbine generator that i mentioned can be used as a large engine motor generator for a ship uh -huh. you can have a you can have a series of them in, in a series of them um if you need it so uh yeah it can be it can be done we we certainly can make ships that can not ever need to buy fuel very interesting well you've, you've already uh done a lot of work on that it sounds like yeah, I've been interested in that since 70. I worked on the, the ship thing was in October 75. Yeah, well, uh, Gary, we do have a hand up from. Dan. Yeah, I, I was just going to go to that. So um, what's the, the question there, Thomas? Uh, Dan, will you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. A quick, couple of questions, Mark. What's the what's the thickness of your ceramic? I imagine you're making really thin ceramic electrolyte types of the sheets. You said it's a saline, so it's a salt based type of ceramic. No, we're actually making about two millimeter thick anode cathode, and uh, we're aiming right now at a solid state electrode, which would also be a couple millimeters. So we're looking at about six millimeter thick by about five by seven millimeter uh, centimeters um, in in sheet size. Interesting. So you're seeing you're seeing good results with that because I know some of the other solid state companies they're making really thin layers to increase the energy density via three, like 3D printing and like binder jetting and other stuff? Our strategy is to make crystals in the kiln, with profusion of, of multiple different crystals in the kiln, which are semiconductors. And um, we'll find out soon, really soon, uh, what, you know, what kind of result we get in terms of, you, you know, charging, holding a charge and that. But the volt open circuit is around two to 2.3, and there's some something we're working on that might be 2.9, and the amps are up there. The amps are, de it's designed for 50 amps around, you know, plus or minus. It'd be interesting too to to see what kind of a kind of a results you can get because the solid state I know it's been notorious for like the lack of ionic conductivity and the the ceramic uh, material and that's kind of uh you know you keep here in 2030 like the big players right now a saku and factorial i um, you probably heard about them ford and bmw they they have something so it'll be kind of interesting to see how this plays out and uh look forward to hearing more about your stuff in the future thank you we are trying to make an end run i've got a question for uh michael um you've heard kind of you know mark roast who's trying to develop a battery and manufacture it here. Uh, Valera, you guys are getting your um, batteries from, I think it's Toshiba. Um, so when the CEC is looking at, you know, investing in a lot of this new battery technology that's going to scale, how much does it consider, I guess, um, the supply chains for um, it and where it's kind of getting developed? How does it kind of weight that? Is it... Um, is it strictly on cost? So, or they... Yeah, so let me, let me, we mentioned longer issue story, but I have to go back and explain to, we have the full spectrum of programs. So we have a small grant program that's 150,000. If you get that, you can get another $400,000. We have programs to pay I'll people- I'll see it, everyone. To pay people to, uh, find, to build their to manufacturing in California. We have other grants that we work where they give follow-on grants to help in the, you know, the Valley of Death, KP. A lot of the time I've been spending lately has been on the larger system. So one of the challenges has been meeting the needs. And so you mentioned supply chain. So one of the challenges we're facing right now in stationary batteries is the lithium ion supply chain is, is pretty well getting cogged up. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 2,500 megawatts of storage has been approved by the Public Utilities Commission. 1,500 has been installed. 1,000 is supposed to be installed in the next year. Another 7,500 will be procured in the next two to four years. However, what we're learning is you can ask for it, but you ain't gonna get it. <laughs> uh, it ain't out there. And, and so if you want lithium ion, we're talking 10, 20, 30, 50 megawatts. We're not talking about a couple hundred kilowatts. And so uh, I got a call last summer and they said, okay, in your non-lithium ion batteries, if we gave you the money, how much could you feel? This was July, 
how much could you feel by the summer of 22? And I said, seriously? I said, yeah, I said, uh, five or 10 megawatts, maybe 20 megawatts for, for four hours or eight hours. And actually, so I, uh, I actually talked to 30 companies and asked them if we had the money, what could you deliver by the summer of 22 to be commissioned by June so it's available for the summer? Two companies out of 30 said they could do it. Uh, one was three megawatts for eight hours. The other one was four megawatts for 10 hours. In fact, that money I mentioned at 340 million, we were supposed to get that money by October and we had made arrangements to sign those agreements by November so they could install and we didn't get that point. But the point was supply chain. They were looking for batteries that had different supply chain than lithium ion. And that, that's gonna be a long-term issue right now. If you talk about the growth that California needs, um, it's just lithium ion, you know, we're not the only ones buying it now. It's, it's growing around the world and uh, they're making commitments around the world. Uh, and the two companies that I talked to, in fact, had just received a hundred plus billion dollars, each of them, and they put a lot of that money in their manufacturing capacity so they could actually generate things in, in uh, less than a year. So, uh, and, and when we look at things going forward, uh, batteries that use non-rare earth materials, batteries that use uh, readily available materials are scoring much better in doing that. So, you know, we uh, just this month submitted our next four year plan to the PUC. Uh, I didn't mention it, but we get about $150 million a year. And last year, we just got a 10 year extension to our program and we were doing our first five-year plan. The first year had already been done. And so we do have a lot of funding in there for energy storage. Um, we spent a lot of money on demonstrations. So we're kind of going back in the cycle now and we're gonna be investing in companies like you're talking about here, companies with new technologies and giving them a chance, typically a one to three to $5 million order to get things. So I think for those of you that are in the startup business, you know, there is gonna be some real opportunity to commission starting in about a year for the, for the next two or three years for people to get that demonstration project out in the field or their first demonstration project, where what we focused a lot on when I talked about the 2020 was people who already had an operating system. And now we ask them to double the duration and anywhere from 15 kilowatts to 400, meg, 400 kilowatts for 10 hours was what we were looking for on those 11 grants that we talked about for long duration. In California right now, there's some questions about, you know, what is the proper mix of long duration and short duration? Short duration is classically defined as 10, four hours or less. Um, and uh, what I mentioned in our case, if we get the legislation that we've asked for uh, approved, then in fact, what will happen is California will define long duration storage as eight hours or more in legislation. So I guess we'll, we'll have a definition of what is long duration storage in California at least. Uh, when I talked to uh, NYSERDA actually uh, a year or so ago, NYSERDA had a goal for batteries of 1500 hours and they doubled it to 3000 hours. And I asked them when they doubled it, how much long duration storage did you consider? And they said, we didn't consider anything over six hours. So we, they, they weren't even looking at long duration storage. Well, now they are, they're beginning to realize it's out there. So I think from, you know, from those of you that are interested and in, you have my number, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody that's here tonight that is interested in what opportunities the Kendrick Commission has. Uh, we have, small grant programs that run year round. We have, we probably award 80 to 100 million, 80 to 100 grants a year uh, out, of the, out of the, in this area, about a third of that 150 million that we get goes to batteries. Uh, the other two third goes to renewables and transportation and the energy efficiency in other areas. So there is a, a huge opportunity. I think, you know, the, the growth market uh, I've been talking all over the world uh, in the last six months about long duration storage. It's a very hot topic uh, right now. And uh, the opportunity is going to just continue to grow. But I think, you know, that there's um, one of the questions we get into is uh, if you're going to do eight hours of storage versus four hours of storage, the duty cycle is pretty common. You're going to do it every day. It'll, it'll operate. It may, uh, you need five or six hours to get through these peak demand periods, but it's gonna operate every day. If you have a hundred hours of storage, 
That's a different question. How do you operate it? How often do you operate? Some of these technologies are, you mentioned $20 a kilowatt hour. So those are those are the range that we're talking about down to 10. Some say they can get to one. I'm not sure they'll ever get there. But the point is they have very inexpensive materials, but the battery duty cycle is also limited. They can't cycle it every day. Uh, they have to cycle it on a high demand. So what we're doing now, one of the, a lot of the effort I'm doing now is trying to understand the duty cycle we would need if we were to award 100, 100 hour storage in the next two years. So, you know, I can tell you if we go to 2040 and we've installed 30,000 megawatts of storage, it's easy for me to say, oh, okay, now what do I need in seasonal storage? Because I know what's not working. When I've got 1,500 hours of storage installed, and I'm going to install 30,000 hours. I find it hard to me to believe when we are short of batteries, if I install a 100 hour system and say, oh, you can only touch that twice a year, uh, that ain't going to fly, you know? <laughs> so we have to have a technology that can, can meet the needs of the grid. And so we are looking, because some technologies can actually uh, work every day and still generate a thousand, uh, 100 hours. Some technologies can't. And so I'm really trying to decide that because we are looking at awarding a hundred hour, uh, just say five megawatt, hundred hour storage system within a year or two. Uh, and I'm expecting to take another two years to build it. So, you know, three to four years would have a system out there. So we're still talking in an environment where the state doesn't have enough batteries to meet their needs. So that's gonna have to respond when needed. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. First of all, back to your supply chain issue. So our, other than the, than the electrodes and the conductors, the rest of the battery is, is generic ceramic materials ground up into powder as they come out of the ground. No refining, no sending it to China, any of that. And the, uh, the, the, the kind of discharging profile that I've been telling, that I'm hearing is uh, discharge 90% or 85% and charge up to 100% um, daily or multiple times per day. And uh, because we're also looking at fast charging. So he actually said, you know, he might be able to, you know, one model looks like 100, like four minutes to do from 20% up to 80% in a 160 kilowatt hour module. Uh, so, Call Peter Mac and see if his hand up. Yeah. So I, I think I'd certainly like to compete for that. But the other piece is we if if we could if we could bid on both X number of batteries that are two hours or four hours and Y number of batteries that are eight hours, then uh, as one package, we could make that work pretty well probably. All right, Peter. So actually, um, yeah. I was going to say one thing real quick, Gary. Uh, one of the one of the questions that are in the chat, I was just looking to see if I could answer any. But one interesting question was how many battery companies haven't made it in the last few years. So I mentioned that one of the one of our high priorities that we're working is working with the investment communities. I've had many discussions. I'm working with them to develop what we call a bankability matrix that we would give to our grant recipients and say, this is the goals you need to show, show for. And if you can meet these points, then we think the investment community will come to you, uh, not, not venture capital, but project financing. Not, not, you know, there's a lot of people that will invest in the company, but they're not gonna pay for your demonstration. You need project financing to get there. And so the truth is right now I'm working to, I mean, I've probably, I've been here 20 years. I've probably had a dozen bankruptcies. I got two right now that I'm doing. Uh, one of them is a simple one that they did there. They don't have a project and we're just mutually agreeing not to go forward because they're insolvent. The other one has five grants that are batteries all over the world, all over the country. I mean, actually all over the state. So we have five different applications and all these batteries are sitting there and the company is no longer around. So we have to work out the details. So what do we do with those? We have to remove them. Nobody wants something they can't get support for. So, and, and that, that impacts the investors see that. So, you know, one of the challenges you run into, if I'm going to finance you for 10, 20 years, how do I know you're going to be around or someone's going to be around to support me for 10, 20 years. And we are getting, you know, more, 
support, but uh, one of those companies that we're talking about has been around more than 10 years and you know, it's not, it's not around anymore. So that's a reality. And, and, and obviously one of the things we do is try to help companies grow, help to grow their manufacturing capacity, help to grow their, their, uh, their engineering force and things so they can have a better sense. So our ultimate charter, when you look at the money we get from the state every year, actually it comes from the ratepayers. Our, our primary money we get comes from the ratepayers. The, the 340 million comes from the general fund. But the ratepayers, and we have to give value back to the ratepayers in doing that. So, you know, we are trying to commercialize products. So our goal is to have new technologies, innovation that's five or 10 years in the future that doesn't exist today. And I can tell you categorically, when you look at batteries, and I mean, Mark brought it up, look at the cost today. And I'm not sure, I saw you chart. I mean, I, I hear I hear these stories of buying batteries for $100 a kilowatt, different things. I, 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 we haven't been able to do that. I mean, I've got 50 grants out there buying batteries and nobody's been able to buy it for less than 200 and most of them are over 300. Now these are small systems, I agree. But, you know, the, the grants that we have, and, and, the, and the projections that they have are roughly 50% of the current cost of batteries. And most of them are there. One of the benefits of this lithium ion growth is it sets a price line. When people come in and talk to me, I want to start this company or whatever, I'm saying, well, here's the price point. If you can't find a way to beat that price point, you're not going to be competitive. And, and, and this is what you got to shoot for. So when you do, your, now I realize you, we work in R&D. So, you know, R&D is expensive. And the projects we have, they have to do monitoring, they have to do analysis. So, you know, there's a 50% buffer that we add to a project just to do, to give us all the stuff we ask for. And they're not going to do that in a commercial system. So it's reasonable to say commercial prices are going to come down. But, you know, it, it is, it is um, uh, I, you know, like I said, we have, 12, 15 different technologies. And almost all of them are predicting that they can get to that point to compete on a price basis and a value basis. Now, sometimes when you're smart, the value isn't just the out the door price, as you mentioned earlier, it's the life cycle cost or other thing, it's the safety. You know, we, we have a large system in California that's, that's not working because of a safety issue. You know, they had to shut down and they haven't restarted yet. So. Those are issues that have to be addressed. Lithium ion, I tell people, you have cell phones, you have, you have, a, you have a, a laptop. How many here have a battery that's five years old? How many here has a battery that's 10 years old? Yeah, well, not too many hands come up. Now it's the same technology. It just may be refined a little bit, but it's the same technology. So there is a huge opportunity for innovation. And what we're trying to do is spur that innovation and provide opportunities. And so we're fortunate in our environment because when we have a solicitation, we normally award five to 10 grants. We don't just award one or two. We have enough for multiple opportunities and we have enough so that when that we're trying, and again, you have to be, you have to, we're encouraging people to build in California. We pay extra money for people to manufacture in California and those type of things. So we're trying to you know, build it in California, prove it, and then sell it all over the world. That, that's, the, that's our desire and to do that. Excellent, Peter. How's your shot? Okay, quick. Before somebody else cuts me in. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I was gonna say was, uh, you know, was back about 15 minutes ago when we were talking about uh, supply chain for the battery itself. Um, you got another problem you have to deal with, and that is uh, interconnection process. Um, if you're talking grid scale. You're looking at well. First off, there's not going to be an open window next year at the ISO. You're going to have to wait till 2023. Then you've got to wait two and a half years before you get a interconnection agreement. And then once you get your interconnection agreement, you got to wait for the utilities to build the facilities that allow you to interconnect. And that's a minimum minimum of 18 months. So um, you know you're looking at five six years before you can interconnect that storage. So if you need it in the next couple of years, you ain't going to get grids. <laughs> unless you take something that's already in a queue. So, um, yeah, new, new well, projects. I, I would only say that's true if you're doing transmission level. That's what I said, you grid mentioned scale. ISO. That's if, what I said, well, grid well, scale. Well, grid scale, grid I mean, you can, you can put a 20 megawatt system on a military base or a tribe on the customer side of the meter. That's correct. If you're going to do 100 megawatts 
And you're right. Those projects, you know, some of the things in the news today, you hear about Hydrostar 400 megawatts. You're, you're right. That, that's a six to eight year process. Yeah, you can't, you can't even do 20 megawatts um, and expect deliverability from the ISO. Right. Even if it's behind the meter, you won't get deliverability. You may be able to connect it, but you'll be energy only at that point. Right. It is a challenge. And even yep. on the customer side of the meter, Interconnection is one of the challenges we run into and we work all the time with the, and of course for the, for the behind the meter, it's the PUC and the utilities, but interconnection of anything, uh, particularly the bigger it gets, is a challenging because you have to run these studies as to how to fix the grid and everything else. And so you are correct. These are, uh, these are, these are quick projects, but I mean, um, in some cases, particularly military bases, universities and tribes, there is a ways to, you could do that at a much more, sorry, now at, at, you're, you're right, you're not necessarily providing, if you're gonna provide grid services on the customer side of the meter, that also is a very complex challenge. Yep. So um, Mike, there's a question that came up. We, we talked about the bankruptcies. On the other side of it, do you have any good success stories that things are close to becoming a commercial enterprise out of the programs that the, the commission has funded, or is it just too soon to tell? No, we've had, I, I, I don't, uh, our different office follows them as in our report, but we've had two companies in the last year that were startups. They started with small grants in, uh, in our business and they, they built components for lithium ion. And two of them have just signed billion dollar agreements. They got acquired. And as part of that, they were providing electric vehicle batteries uh, and providing anodes and cathodes to those types of things, so components to lithium ion batteries that are better. Uh, and so we've had several companies that have been able to, uh, we typically speaking, a small grant program that we manage, probably 50% of the small grants are able to attract venture capital funding uh, when they're done with the grant. And, and so we have a very large amount of venture capital funding that goes with these systems. It's the, it's the project financing that is the challenge we're working now, uh, not the venture capital funding. But yes, there are some some big, I gotta get my light here, this room cuts off and then my computer will cut off just a second. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it, yes, we have, and I, and I can share those, I can share those with you. If somebody's interested, if somebody made a comment by email, I'm assuming you're gonna share the presentation. So my email address is on my presentation. And if anybody has questions, Feel free to reach out to me and I can share with you how to get in the queue with the Energy Commission grants and how the process works. And uh, if you're interested, it'll come right in your email uh, whenever they're released. And we release about uh, 20 solicitations a year. All right. Well, thank you. I'm sure that's very helpful. Then one more thing, Mike, while we've got you uh, on the screen here. Um, on the long duration storage, however that ends up getting defined, it's, it would seem to compete with things that you could do in controlling demand, controlling microgrids. How do you see that shaping up? Um, because what you're trying to cover with long duration storage might be covered in, in other ways. Do you, do you think that uh, is a real possibility out there? And, and so there's, there's a new phrase coming around. There's a new phrase coming around, uh, you know, zero carbon uh, flexible resources uh, that's out there. And so uh, I don't know that long duration fits in that category as much as what I'll call short duration, but there is, you get demand response, you have bioenergy projects, you have other things. So you have other things besides storage. So one of the things we are doing is looking at all the different options. I mean, when you, uh, I gave a presentation today to the legislature uh, on, hyd green hyd on green hydrogen and the future for hydrogen and green hydrogen. And so the, the question comes down is when you look at these different options, and there are several, is coming out with what's going to provide the best product for the best value. So you can't say that any single product is going to be the home run that everybody goes after right now. But what you can say is that there are multiple choices. And at the end of the day, I, I do believe the price is going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference in the, in the system. When you start talking about what I talk to the people, the public utilities come in, if you're going to buy 10,000 megawatts of storage, or just say after January 2030, you're going to buy 20,000 megawatts of storage. If you can buy that for 30% cheaper than you're buying for the first 10,000, that's a huge amount of money. 
And it's worth in nurturing these technologies to get to that point. That's what I'm trying to do is convince the, the agencies that control the money, to control the utilities to say, look, you have to think beyond today's solution and you have to think what you can do to help in that process to give these technologies a chance to demonstrate their capability. At the end of the day, you're gonna to have to perform. I mean, these are long duration means, it also means you're gonna be around for 20 years in right. addition to operating for you know, 10 to 100 hours. And so if you don't perform, it ain't gonna take long, that that's gonna be over with quick. <laughs> so you have, you have to perform and uh, not everybody's gonna do that, um, but um, Today's world is very competitive and most people have to incrementally prove their capacity to do that. I won't mention for Garrett's benefit, but one, another one of the projects we awarded in 2020 was for residential storage. So we awarded three grants and each grant is putting in 15 sites uh, at, three different t at three different climate zones. And, and in addition to putting it in and making it work, one of the things you're doing is what Garrett showed is looking for creative tariffs that we can offer to the PUC that will allow homeowners to maximize the value of the storage that's in their garage. And so this is all part of Title 24 and what they call uh, JA-19. And so I'm um, JA-12. And so the, uh, the, 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 the ultimate value is, you know, we want customers to be able to provide, you know, demand response is easy to export is more difficult. And so looking at those different values, um, uh, it's how, how if we're going to have, you know, 10 million homes with solar on the roof and batteries in the garage, it's no different than if we're going to have 10,000 electric vehicles plugged into the grid. You have to assume them as a resource. And do you want them just to be a load or do you want them to be part of the interactive grid? You know, the, right. the, the software can do it. It's just the policies and the regulations that have to be updated. Right. Let me toss last question here to Garrett. I mean, obviously great to see uh, manufacturing coming into the Sacramento area, the systems you're building. Where where are you on that curve right now? How many people do you think you're, you're employing now and what's your plan over the next year for the Valora systems? Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Um, we have about 10 people um, on, on this team, this subsidiary of Valora Energy right now. Um, next year, I hope to, you know, three to five X that, um, and in the very near future, we're, we're in a pretty small, uh, what I call boutique manufacturing facility right now. Um, and in the very near future, uh, we're moving into a much larger facility. So that, that should enable us to 10 or even 50 X our production capacity. That'd be fantastic. What a nice industry for the area. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and I mentioned before that our battery cells come from Japan, uh, where Toshiba is based. Um, almost all of the rest of the components and the value-added manufacturing and assembling happens in the U.S. So we're uh, we're pretty proud of that. Well, and and I mean, over time, if you get a considerable demand here, um, it would be common if somebody like Toshiba ends up producing a factory in the US to, to get the logistics out of the equation. Uh, that's certainly happened on a lot of the electronics. It certainly happened in automobile manufacturers. So yeah, I, I for one, I'm not that worried about sourcing things to Japan or China when you get started with a view in mind that ultimately you wanna get the, the whole uh, supply chain close to you and, and in the US. Yeah, thank, thankfully, you know, Valar Energy feels like a, a, you know, somewhat scrappy startup in a lot of ways, um, but as, as a part of a much larger parent company, you know, Valara Corporation has been doing, um, you know, supply chain logistics for over 70 years. And so being able to stand on the shoulders of giants um, has really helped us quite a bit with managing our supply chain. So we haven't, we've hardly really been slowed um, which is in stark contrast to a lot of other battery manufacturers. Yeah, and, and kudos to Rick Wiley and, and all the clever things that he's done to reorient the company and, and, and grow it. Uh, it's really been a nice story. Well, we're at the end of our time here, and let's give all of our panelists and everybody who's participated a big round of applause. And um, 
gosh, it's just been a wonderful discussion. Another one that I'm sure we'll come back to uh, in the following year uh, because there's just so much going on. And, and uh, thanks to Mark and Mike and Garrett for their participation. So uh, over to you, uh, Thomas, to wrap us up. I'll, I'll wrap us up really quickly, but I do need to ask one more question. And if you each can give, you know, a really quick short answer on it, because we had people actually email and ask us about this one is um, what are you considering or thinking about on, I know it's a short for an opening question, uh, battery recycling. Garrett, what are you, what are you for me? Yes, for all of yeah. you. Yeah, well, battery recycling is a really important consideration. Uh, I mean, you know, since a, a lot of people are motivated by trying to, um, you know, be friendly to the environment. Um, but when, when batteries wear out and are sort of unusable or practically unusable after 10 years, you really got to think about um, kind of cycling those down. Um, and with our with the batteries that last 20 years, my feeling is that we have about another 10 years before we even have to begin to worry about how we're going to recycle the batteries. A lot of batteries get recycled into the home energy space, you know, from something like the electric vehicles um, into home energy. So we're actually starting at home energy. So I think that you know, our, our warranty is 20 years. I expect our batteries will last quite a bit longer. You know, if I had a if I had a battery that was still at let's say 75% capacity after 25 years, I don't know why I would take it down. It's still still providing quite a bit of value. So we're not we're not um, too concerned with recycling just yet. Mike. And ours, our, we're looking at 90, 95% recyclable. And also I'm, there's a short, there's potentially a very short path for the recycling technically. So uh, the... Yeah, uh, I'll just add real quick that we are investing in battery ticket loose use for lithium ion batteries. I will point out, if you haven't heard this story, that in the California today, 50% of the electric vehicles in the U.S. are in California. So obviously, when it comes time to recycle, we're going to have the biggest supply. So we are doing work on both recycling and second use. It is a topic uh, of interest to California. But again, as we look at our leading the nation in this area, we will end up in the future with the most potential. But again, as you, Gareth mentioned, a lot of these electric vehicle batteries, when they don't have the power you want when you press the gas pedal down, they still can operate 10, 15 years in a stationary environment. So recycling may not be necessarily breaking it apart. It may be repurposing it to a new use. Um, local company um, Fox Power has been trying to do that. I know the CEC has funded them in the past through programs, um, but we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank you guys for that. One of our most attended events last year was Recycling Solar. So um, with that, a big thank you to our guests. Thank you very much for attending you guys and they are for joining us with that. Uh, sorry. Um, big thank you to our guests. Thank you for making this possible and joining us. We appreciate your expertise and look forward to connecting with you in the future. Um, if you want to watch past discussions or this one, they will be up on our YouTube channel and you can check out the interesting discussions around that. Um, additionally, if you believe in what we're doing and want to support us, we're in the midst of our fundraising campaign. We did get some donations during this, so I want to thank Laura Good for donating to us. But if you believe in what you're doing, um, please support us. Um, any amount of donation helps. And it really goes a long way in showing that you believe in what we're trying to do here of turning Sacramento and the greater region into a clean tech hub. Thank you to our sponsors, Sac State, SMUD, Wine Tribe, Tobin, and Blue Tech Valley. Thank you to our overall program sponsors of Momentum, GT Law, Pin Motion, Hacker Lab, Moss Adams, and Reverend. And I wanna thank all of you for attending today. And I look forward to connecting with you in the future. And if you wanna connect with any of the speakers, please do reach out to me and I'll put also their slides in an email after this tomorrow. Thank you very much. Great meeting. Great meeting. Take Thanks, care. Thomas. Thank you very much. You guys have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Bye.